My name's Maggie Nichols, um, and I use my voice, and I play keyboard, and I, I'm between London and Wales, and I love music. I love contradictions, and I love the gathering, and I just feel very passionate and very blessed and very lucky to be having the music make me. Oh, the past is such a heavy weight to carry Sometimes seems like things are never gonna change It's like a long cold winter that feels without an end But in the earth are the changes that bring spring through Fresh new life Fragile and unsure, got the strength of tomorrow, strength of tomorrow, strength of tomorrow. Yesterday is dead. And today is always dying Cause change is the one thing We can rely on Breaking out of the old skin Couldn't cling anymore Fresh new life Fragile and unsure We've got the strength of tomorrow Strength of tomorrow Strength of tomorrow Getting ready today Well, I grew up in Scotland. I was born in Edinburgh. My mum is half French and half Berber from the Mountains of, Alger uh, mountains of Algeria. My dad was born in the Isle of Skye, um, up in the highlands of Scotland. Um, oh, I was a bit of a tomboy. Um, I was, was very pleased when I used to have very, very short hair, which I've gone back to, and I used to love it when people said sunny in the shops. Um, my mum ran away from home to go on stage so she's always been an inspiration in terms of she's well she's always wanted me probably to fulfill her not fully realized dreams because mum gave up she ran away from home to go on stage and sing and acting and then sort of gave up and she married my dad so that was difficult left school at 15 and was a windmill girl. That was quite an experience. I literally just walked into the windmill and said I would like a job and they auditioned me. And uh, that was quite, I lied about my age, but I realize now that Sheila Van Dam probably didn't care. Probably the younger the better when I look back thinking now. It was great, it was a great training, the windmill, because we did every kind of dancing. It was semi-nude, though, so it was, very, it was quite a different life, you know, being that young. And then I got taken down Ronnie Scott's um, in the most awful way. A, a little villain I knew, a little gangster, said, you want to go down Ronnie Scott's? And I went, oh, God, yeah, because I thought I'd tell Selena all about this. And he said, wait here. And he went down the stairs and I heard him say to Ronnie, Scott, Ronnie, um, Ronnie, there's a girl up there who says she knows you. <laughs> and that's how he got me into the club for nothing, because Ronnie probably thought, oh God, somebody, I, you know, somebody, I, I better let her in. She's probably somebody I've had a one night stand with and I'd never met him in my life. But anyway, that's how I first went down Ronnie's. And then I just soaked in the music and I never saw any women playing instruments. And that is for me why I think I use my voice the way I did because if I'd seen somebody play an instrument I would have been an instrumentalist but because I saw women singing and men playing instruments so as far as I was concerned 
women were not biologically suited to plague instruments. I mean, I can't believe how naive I was. I honestly, honestly thought that the, in some naive way that women weren't capable. Anyway, but I, I, I just soaked all the, the instrumentals up and just my yearning to, 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 to explore like them was what probably got me using my voice as an instrument as well as, as a vehicle for telling a story because I love to tell a story through singing a so songs as well. I love songs. I love, you know, the, the sort of beautiful words if, if a song's got words. There weren't any women. The only women were either wives or the only w women I ever, women I met really that were there apart from being girlfriends and wives was Val Wilmer. I don't know if you know Val, the wonderful photographer. Val, oh, she was very protective of me. She said in her book, and I mean, I, I love Val. She said how sweet and shy, and I thought I'm just, I thought it was a little scrubber, you know. And she said I was sweet and shy. I, I did get used. I got exploited terribly by a lot of the male musicians, and really badly, really badly, because I was, what, I was 16 when, I, you know, I, I, well, 15 probably, because I was still at the windmill, and then I let the windmill closed when I was 16. So probably, yeah, 15, 16. And I just wanted to belong, I wanted to talk about music, and I was just very naive, and uh, yeah, it wasn't good. And then in 1968, how I got into improvised music was Ronnie Scott's in Gerrard Street closed and it moved to Frith Street. And in the meantime, I'd been abroad for a year as a dancer, because my mum was desperate, because I was still going down all the clubs, and I had a lot, you know, and a lot, there was a lot of people, I was almost on the point of seriously taking drugs. I'd sort of dabbled, but, and mum was so desperate, she hunted down an agent, and I got this job dancing abroad for a year. So I didn't do any singing, really, for, for that year. And then when I got back to London, the, the, a new club had opened in the place where the original Ronnie's was. They'd, Ronnie Scott's had moved to Frist Street, and in, the, in its place, was a place called the Old Place, where all these experimental musicians were, were playing, Mike Westbrook, John Sermon, all sorts of... And I remember raving one night to somebody, saying, I can hear a voice, I can hear a voice in this, and it was all quite free jazz, full on. And somebody said, oh, John Stevens um, uses singers at the Little Theatre Club, and that was in uh, St Martin's Lane. So, off I went, up all these stairs. I was like shaking like a leaf, I was so nervous. And John has said, look, it doesn't matter if your voice croaks or wavers, it really doesn't matter. And he played this gong, he played this beautiful overtone on a gong. Trevor played a note, there was only three of us, so I was really exposed. It wasn't like today with loads of voices. And I literally was, ah, 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 ah. But I just kept going, I just kept going, and eventually the voice steadied, and the, I was listening to the sax and the overtones and the gong. And before I knew what had happened, I was improvising. And I couldn't believe it. And I'd never experienced anything like that in my life. It was, as, it really was bliss. It, I was ecstatic. I couldn't believe it. And John said, well, come every, come every weekend. You know, can you, I just joined that. I just got to join the group. I started running workshops. And then, oh, about a year later, I think Peter Oliver said, there are some actors that would like to to do some singing, where you run a voice workshop, and I went, yes, and I bought a Teach Yourself, you know, those black and yellow Teach Yourself books, Teach Yourself Singing, and I, and, and I did a mixture of, you know, like, the sort of, the, and the, ah, and, e, e. <laughs> so it was a weird mix, la, 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 it was a real weird mix of stuff, you know, exercises, sort of conventional vocal exercises, and sort of, you know, meditation, and, and sort of why it was it was incredible I just was just like a magpie I just was learning all the stuff from different people which gradually I suppose I've drawn drawn on, on all these different influences and developed my own way of teaching and, and, and doing it so that's really how I started running workshops and then how I got into women's movement where are we now? So this is 1970, and my daughter was born in 1970, 69, 70, and um, Aura was born in 70, I started doing the workshop 69, carried through the 70s, joined the Workers' Revolutionary Party. I was just getting exposed to feminism. I remember what happened. There was a canteen at the Oval House, 
and in the canteen was this battered copy of Germaine Greer's The Female Eunuch. And I remember it was almost like it was like, you know, it was like a, I don't know, it was almost like I was picking up something really kind of taboo and, you know, my God, you know. Because feminism was something frightening when you were, you know, in them days, if you were sort of more, you know, I, I, for me, all I wanted was for men to approve of me. I just thought, I, I had no con concept of, you know, of self-esteem in, in, uh, independently of male approval. I really was what Mary Daly calls mad, you know, male approval desire. That was definitely me. And um, so I picked up this copy and I snuck it home. I, I borrowed it. And I think the thing that really, really hit me was her chapter, Fear, Loathing and Disgust, about how, you know, that, the polit you know, that it was political that girls and young women used sexually. And it was like suddenly, oh, oh my God, that's me. And it wasn't just me. This is, so this is not just me being stupid, me being a scrubber, me being not knowing how to say no. Or it was just so, whoa. Oh, I was doing something at the almost, no, at the drill hall. I was running some voice workshops and, oh God, what were they called? The Lesbian Theatre Group. Oh my God, Tash Fairbanks was in it. I can't remember. Anyway, they were doing a play about lesbian mothers in custody and there was Tash. So when I saw Tash, it was like, oh. Uh, and I, I, but she was my first lesbian feminist. I had no idea. I, as far I knew, you know, the wonderful butch femme scene. And I, lo those butch women were amazing women. And I will never let a word be said against them because they were incredible women. However, this was, you know, there was Tash, and we were, we went out together for a bit, and um, it was amazing. Actually, it was lovely. And uh, then through. Tash, I got introduced to these women's squats in Vauxhall, which is, you know, so, and I went straight from this sort of world of wanting male approval to suddenly lesbian separatism. <laughs> and it was like, dang! And it was like, you know, because I, I was just thinking, I'm, I'm probably bisexual. And next thing I know, is, no, you're a, you know, men, men. I was scared to see a man in the street in case I knew him and I'd have to, you know, betray my friendship by actually ignoring him or, you know, or being or betraying the sisters by saying hello. And it was just, I just went plunged into this. So it was both absolutely magnificent and, you know, quite, you know, quite crazy. I'd, I'd been exposed to feminist improvising group, and that was FIG. And that was extraordinary, because what happened, how that came about, I went to a gig, and I saw Carol, Carol Grimes. I'd met Carol before, but um, in a studio somewhere, when she was singing with a, a band, and I was there to do something, and we'd met briefly. And it was some, I think it was a music for socialism. I can't remember what that event was called, anyway. And it was, and I remember thinking, oh, it's great, but the only women are singers again. There are no women instrumentalists. So I, I remember saying to the organisers, really, you need to, to get some bands where there are more women playing. And they said, well, would you like you know, to do something at the next festival? And I said, yes. So I, um, I'd met Lindsay Cooper, the bassoon player and sopranina player. She, I'd met her at the Oval House when she was in a theatre group and they'd come to my workshops, and we got on really well. So I can't remember how I contacted or whether we just saw each other, and I said, God, it would be great, wouldn't it be great to do something with women? And she knew two other women from Henry Cow, Georgie Bourne, cello player, and who else? No, 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 she got Georgie, and no, that's it, Georgie. Oh, and she knew Kathy Williams from, from the rockin' opposition scene. And then I got Kareem, who I met down at the squats in, in Vauxhall, who, the trumpet player who played with Jam today, Kareem Yensel. And we, lit, we, were, we, said, we sent off to the organisers, said we were a women's improvising group and we're going to, you know. Next thing we know on the posters, feminist improvising group. We didn't call ourselves the feminist improvising group. It was quite extraordinary that all the publicity came through feminist improvising group. So, we went, all right then, okay. <laughs> and we did this workshop and we explored the personal is political and everything. And um, 
with me it was being a, a mum, being a mother, and, the, and, and, and a, a musician as well, and all the stuff and the different faces people saw of me running a workshop and being all kind of, and then the same woman had seen me in a coffee bar being all harassed with my daughter saying, finish your chips, eat your chips. And then Kareen had a disability and she had, a, you know, issues about being patronised and being a black woman being, and, and, you know, and being treated like a child. So we immediately, there was an improvising dynamic there, mother and child. And then uh, Georgie had a whole thing about her appearance and her weight, so she was going to do something around that. Kathy was the kind of the hippie chick that was around all the men and, and she did something around that. Lindsay had played in classical musicians and had always had to wear the, the black. So she dressed up in black. So we literally, that first gig, it was just, we went. They didn't know what they'd done calling us feminist improvising group. We really, really went for it. And it freaked people out. We had people absolutely loving us. And, and what was amazing, we had all these women that came and they sat through some of these more sort of cerebral male improvisers, quite bored. Although there was some lovely stuff happening, but they'd never heard free improvisation before. And then we came on and it was theatre and comedy and we were chopping onions and, and then Lindsay was spraying perfume to disguise the smell of the onions and we came on and, and this, I was with Kareen and, you know, Kareen was coming on and I was saying, look, go and, go and play, go and play. And then she'd play the trumpet. No, shh, the neighbours, the neighbours, you know, I'm doing this mad. It was just incredible. And then playing music as well. And we were a really, really revolutionary radical group. We really were, and it was, and for me, I had never experienced being in a group with women. I mean, I'd, some of my dear, dear friend Julie Tippetts, you know, as a, with another singer who I love and who is the most, we, and that was the, and a really, we really have a deep um, musical relationship. And yet I'd never, ever just been in, just experienced this with women, and we, and we started getting gigs. And then we started touring, and then other women. The original idea was an open pool of women improvisers, and then Angel from Jam Today joined, and then Irena Schweitzer, and and it was incredible because we 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 just hung out together, and it was like, oh my goodness, it's so wonderful being so you know because I'd I'd experienced musical intimacy, but not not with women. So that was that was fig was amazing. I loved the diversity. Of, I loved the fact that we could we could be really clumsy and then do something incredibly you know graceful and we could go from slapstick humor into lyrical and whatever. I thought that was our strength. We didn't use any structures in the end. We just we just went on and we played. We just completely free, just improvised, no structure, no preconceptions. And for for women like Irena that was fine for me, for Kareen for Lindsay too, and then I think, uh, you know, I think there, w there would be again, I think, in the beginning, everybody totally trusted it. It's that thing about trust. When we trusted, there was never a problem. But then, as I say, as soon as there was the little whisperings from some of the male musicians that the women knew, then they started getting self-conscious about the so-called aesthetics. Is this, you know, it, it, w they started worrying about the nature of the music we were doing which I think was very, very sad, very painful. So in a sense, I suppose the theatre enabled us to maybe just take, it, uh, take the politics further and express it through role play, through text, through comedy, you know, through, through sort of like, yeah, I think that through, through, through words and, and through, yeah, through theatre. And, and I think that was a, that's what was a very, very strong. And I say not, you know, some of the women probably would have preferred it just to be music. Although I think everyone in Fig did get into the theatre a bit in the end. I think they did. They might not have wanted to so much, but I think they did. And I think it was, you know, it had its strengths and it had its weaknesses. I think when we were being authentic and we were true, you know, then it was brilliant. When it became a pastiche, there was a point where I think when we started losing that solidarity a little, where I think then we almost became... A parody of ourselves. We lost the, 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 the authentic edge that we'd had when we re were really driven and we meant it. We really meant it. So contradictions then became that thing of it really being an open women's performance, so sort of music, uh, 
open women's workshop performance group with no nobody has to perform in, in, in contradictions if they don't want to but we perform as well and then of course all my other loves like dance theater were brought in and we we did we oh that started in 1980 and there's been hundreds of women been through contradictions since 1980 and again because it's open it's never it's never sort of um It's never had to, to break up. It might go dormant, there might be times when nothing's happening. And then like Shirley started it here again, because Shirley was in the original Contradictions in London. And then about a year ago, she said, Mag, I think we should just maybe get together with some women and, you know, share, bring all the different food to share and, you know, and then and then it turned out, you know, we started talking about maybe doing some stuff. And, and, it, and now, whereas before I used to facilitate every, like I was saying, I used to do all the workshops. Apart from when we did something at Women's Land in Wales, Kevin Vilach, we had a little festival. And Libby Gallagher, who's a, a, an a actress, she actually did some theatre stuff. And I, th and I think somebody else did a mask thing. And However, on the whole, it's been me. And, um, and it's great now because we take it in turns. So it's it's really really lovely. Different women come forward and and share what they want to do, and it's open to anybody. It's any woman can join contradictions. And what's been very exciting for me, you know, it has been. I mean, it's not in in Wales. It's more white, but um, but in it's always been a good strong contingent of working class women, and women of different races. When it was in London, in particular, because obviously it's a more it's a multiracial place than Wales. So that that's that's been fantastic. Improvisation is the source, it's the source of everything, even composition. You know, you're walking along and an idea comes, it, it comes spontaneously, you know, where it, where it is, and then maybe you shape it and you craft it. What's so beautiful about free improvisation is that you can create the most phenomenal structures. Non-hierarchical, learning, mm. sort of negotiating issues of leading and following where one time somebody might be taking the initiative and then somebody else. So the, 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 the shift is, is the, the focus is shifting and then nobody's leading, nobody's leading, nobody's following and it's all, it's self reg it's autonomy. It's kind of a kind of anarchist music and it's really, it's really anarchist in, in, and, and, in and, 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 you know, really learning how to sort of give and take. Mm. It is, a, it is an amazing language, it is extraordinary because nobody's conducting. You see male musicians and they have all these wives that do all their admin and, you know, and it, it's quite, um, yeah, it was interesting for me that I don't think I could have been an instrumentalist and a, almost. I mean, I know some women have managed it. I think Irena and Joelle not having children and they could just really practice. For me, practicing was washing nappies and singing on the roof as I hung the, the nappies out, you know, this is before disposable nappies, and just, you know, just singing where I could, fitting it in however I could. I think when I was first came out as a, a feminist and a lesbian and, and, and also a socialist and all that, I almost felt compelled to make my performances super political. And I don't regret that, I think it was incredible, I think it was of the times, now maybe it still comes out, especially with Lady Abolik, you know, but it's probably I'm more now the things, the issues for me are more around mental health and stuff like that I feel very passionate about. And, you know, or issues, but I, I suppose I feel, now that I'm older, I'm suddenly, ex it's okay. I, I think as an older woman, it's quite interesting that you suddenly get authority as an older woman. We're still living in a male-dominated world, and I think... Yeah, not if you're an old, uh, uh, I'm sure you become invisible as an, old, an older woman in the street, if I'm on the tube, no, but I mean in terms of people, you know, in terms of the, the music world, I'm suddenly allowed to be eccentric, I'm allowed to be, you know, it, it, it's, it's seen, was before, you know, it, it was, you know, it was a, a reason they could, re they could really put me down, critics used to, oh, used to put me down a lot, for, for being, you know, so open and, per, you know, the personal is political and all the stuff that I used to sort of, you know, and it was. And I sort of hung in there and, uh, and now I, I feel I've got to the point where I, I trust and I, no, 
topics. You know, this is this is what I do. I, when I see uh, impro engaged, totally committed improvisers, I'm on the edge of my seat. I, I don't know where it's going to go next. That's amazing. And the beautiful thing is that the everybody, the listener and the performer. They're in it together. It's not here's one I prepared made earlier. It's like you're what you are part of what's unfolding as a listener as well. So, so people often say, oh well, it's all right to do it, but it's self-indulgent. But you wouldn't want to, you know, it's not wouldn't want to listen to it. I love listening to it because I see all the humanity, even when people are struggling, even when I see, you know, or hear uh, improvising, you can see that they've lost touch with each other a bit. And this, and I just think, oh, how are they going to? You, you, you just with them, and you just. It's it's amazing. It's so human. It's so human in all our excellence and our frailty and all our confidence and all our insecurities and all that you know, and then it's beyond human as well because it's nature, it's universe, it's everything. God I am but <laughs> I'm really going over the top here. <laughs> <laughs> oh that was <laughs> I, I do that. like a good tune. My mum's always saying, oh, darling, I love it when you sing a melody, my mum says. <laughs> <laughs> Although my mum's a great improviser herself. I wonder if she gets going. Chant, 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 chant,